Man, gosh, it is, it's fun to worship. Uh, man, I, I read this article way back when. I don't know how legitimate it was, but I thought it was super cool. And it was just talking about um, why, why we should sing. Like why, uh, just like a cool scientific fact about it. It's like when choirs and stuff sing together and their breathing is in rhythm. So they're, they're taking breaths at the same time. They're singing the same choruses and the stuff. It says that there's this phenomenon that their hearts will start beating together. Now, I thought that was so cool that it's something that actually happens when we all become uniform, when we all begin singing these praises. It says the hearts actually start to beat in rhythm with one another. And I think that is so cool. That has always blown my mind. I think of that, like, as I'm singing with y'all, we're singing the same words, we're in the same congregation, we're all in Brown County, and we're serving the same God, and now all of our hearts are in rhythm. Unless you have, like, a arrhythmia or something, I don't know. But <laughs> we'll, we'll pray for you. But if you don't know me, my name is Alex Bingham. I am the new youth director. Uh, I think I'm working on a month and a half now. So, yeah, I'm still here, and it's good. <laughs> oh, but something you may not have known about me before I came to Howard Payne and I played basketball here, uh, I actually worked in the oil field in Baytown, Texas, which is like south of Houston. And uh, I did my first year of college there. I was actually studying mechanical technicians. So uh, I was working on basic, if you've ever had like a pressure washer, it's like a, like times a thousand. So like we were working with these, these units that can cut a foot of steel. And like that's like, I was way too young. I knew enough to, to be dangerous. Uh, but they let me work in that, and I loved it. So I'll tell you that. It's like a little bit of my background. It's like I feel a little competent when it comes to like working on stuff. Like I feel that I know my way around a wrench, and I can, I can fix some stuff in the house. So my truck broke down uh, last week. And it was, it was a water pump. Me and my dad kind of looked at it and said, like, this is the problem. And I was like, okay, I got this. Like, this is not too hard. I'm, I'm going to bring it back to the old mechanic days. And so this last Saturday, me and my roommate, Trey, we uh, devoted our Saturday to fixing my truck. And so we, we go to, to Napa. We get the part. We're breaking everything down. We're feeling like real manly men. I'm looking at it. I was like, no, we're going to do this job right. So I start cleaning up the engine. I start digging in there, doing all this. We put it all back together, fire up the truck. It runs great. I'm pumped. I'm pumped. I'm feeling myself. I'm like, man, this is back in the old days. Well, we, I, I decided to be like the glorious mechanic. And I was like, you know what? I'm going to flush the radiator too. Just get it nice and clean and ready. And I went to go and, and put everything back together again. If you can't see this, it's because it's small. And I couldn't see it either. And I lost it. This is not the one that's on my truck right now because I had to go get a new one. <laughs> my truck, it was dead in the water after all this extensive work because of a $3 plastic plug to my radiator. It's a real humbling moment <laughs> when I, all this time, it's like, I can't drive my truck now because of a drain plug. And like, I could try, like I could, I could fill it up and I could get, you know, a quarter of a mile down the road before everything dumps out and my engine overheats and blows up. But so the reason I, I, I bring us to this story and tell us about this is Joey, the last couple of weeks has been talking about tipping point. Like our church is at a tipping point. Like, I'm coming in, and I'm feeling the excitement. I'm seeing God move in a real way, and it's blowing my mind, and I'm excited. And he's talking about, like, these things that lead to a tip tipping point. Week one, we talked about it's the small things. It's the little things in our life that will lead to big results. So, like, st coming over here and praying 30 minutes before the service, that may be something that you've never thought of before, but it's like, no, we're going to do it. We're going to step out in faith. We're going to pray. I'm going to devote this time to God. Or like reading a chapter a day or something small, but man, it yields great results. And last week we talked about like an epidemic, how it spreads from mouth to mouth. That like, just like a, a virus or like a, a, almost like a social media craze, out of nowhere you can wake up and there's this thing that has millions upon millions of views. And so this week I wanted to focus in on like how that drain plug was such a small piece. But man, without it, it didn't function. My truck, it needed this other work. It needed a new water pump. That was a reality. But I forgot something. And it made it all void. And so what I want to make that metaphor today is that it's our heart. 
I believe that this church is going to do some amazing things, and it already is. But our hearts have to stay in tune with the Father. We have to be going to Christ every day, no matter how big are these things. I mean, there's some cool things coming. Like, the stage looks great. The band sounds awesome. We're getting more seating in here. Like, there's a lot of things. Like, I can't really talk about that. I'm excited the direction that this church is going. But man, if we forget Jesus in the process, none of this matters. We could tear all this down and build a brand new multi-billion dollar building. And if Christ isn't in it, it doesn't matter. So I'm going to pray before we dive into the Word. If you want to go ahead and move into your Bible to Malachi, we're going to be in Malachi chapter 1. Go and pray for us. God, thank you for the opportunity to speak to your church, that I get to be a part of a church, that we get to, to experience this crazy life together. God, just be with us as we open your Word, as we read the Scripture that you've given us for guidance, for warning, for hope. God, I pray that it penetrates us deep, that we see the truths that you've set before us, that we can learn and that we can leave changed. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. All right, so some background to Malachi. It is not very, I mean, it's not something that we just read to like immediately. It's probably not your average VBS story. So Malachi is actually a minor prophet. And so what minor prophets were, or not minor prophets, just prophets in general, is that they were mouthpieces for God. So God would speak to the prophet, the prophet would go to the people, and then he would say, declare what God was saying. And so what we find ourselves here in just kind of the history of Israel is that they had just gotten out of Babylonian exile. God had rescued them, they have come back, they rebuilt the temple. That's their house of worship. I mean, that is the meeting place of God. Life is beginning to come back to normal. They're beginning to make sacrifices. They're beginning to worship again. Like they are becoming the Israelite people once more. But what happens, like we know of the Israel, if you know any history of the Old Testament, they do what they always do and they forget. And so Malachi is again, like many other of the prophets, is going to remind them what is truly important. And so I'm going to pick up in verse 6. And this is God speaking. A son honors his father. And a servant, his master. But if I am a father, where's my honor? If I am a master, where is your fear of me? Says Yahweh, the host to your priest, who despise my name. Yet you ask, how have we despised your name? So this is like a kid. This is like bartering. Like for me, like my mom says, like, clean your room. And I was like, it is clean. It's like, no, it's not. Like you moved your pile from the center of the room to the outside. I was like, but it's, it's cleaner He's like bartering with God. So that's how the prophets work. Normally it's God showing them what's wrong, the people like coming back and giving their excuse, and then God answering once more. That's kind of like the flow of thought. Go read this on your own. It's a quick book. It's four chapters, but it packs a punch. So going on, it says, how have we defiled your name? And God answers, by presenting defiled food to my altar. You ask, how have we defiled you? When you say the Lord's table is contemptible, like we don't really care. When you present blind animals for sacrifice, is it not wrong? When you present lame or sick animals, is it not wrong? Would you bring this to your governor? Would he be pleased or show you favor? Ask the Lord of hosts. And now you ask for God's favor. Will he be gracious to us? Since you have come from your hands, he will, will he show any of you fla- uh, favor? Not flavor, favor. Favor. He goes, I wish one of you would shut the doors of the temple. I wish you would no longer uh, kindle a fire on my altar. I'm not pleased with you, says the Lord. All right, so I'm gonna explain what's going on here. So the priest, their job, he's talking to the priest. They're the ones who are supposed to present a sacrifice to God, and it's supposed to be the cream of the crop. They're supposed to go and see the lambs that were like presented to them and given, and they're supposed to pick the most unblemished, spotless one, the most healthy, fattened one, and they're supposed to give that to God because it's supposed to be for us that we are to give God our full selves. If we think back to Deuteronomy, love the Lord God with all your soul, mind, and strength, it's all of you, it's everything. But he's saying these priests are like walking over to the stable, and they're looking, and there's all the little sheep going around, and there's like the really nice ones that... Actually, I kind of want to eat that one later. Uh, uh, but, but back in the corner, there's like, there's Gumpy. 
And like, you know, he got in a fight and he's got like a, a gimp leg and he kind of smashes his head into the, the wall every now and then. And I don't think he can see too well. You know, like, let's grab him. Like, God's good with that. And then they, they like sacrifice it. And, and they're like, ah, I don't think God really cares that much. Or they're, they're like, they're taking stolen animals. Like, the book goes on and on to say, like, what these priests are doing. And these are, these are the priests. These aren't just the people. These are the guys who are supposed to be the example for Israel. And they're over here getting, like, half-dead animals and sacrificing it. And God's like, and then here, here's the crazy thing, is that they have the audacity to ask God to bless them. So it's this, like, it's, it's this attitude. And, like, some of us have it. Like, I mean, I'm, I'm guilty of this, of, like, blessing God with my time. Like, I'm a busy guy. I got a lot of stuff to do. Like, for me to cut out, like, two hours to go to church and go mingle with people I really don't like that much, and, you know, like, I got to be here for a little while, and, you know, God should be thankful because, you know, who I am in the community. Like, a lot of people know Alex Bingham. You know, I played basketball. You know, like, it's just this attitude that we can get into. Like, these Israelite priests are just like, ah, I mean, it became a checklist. It became a job to them. And God says, that is, that's rotten worship. And because, look, this is what's so crazy is, before God ever accepts your gift, he inspects your heart. Let's look at Cain and Abel. Bring it back to Genesis. They both brought God a sacrifice, but one was accepted and the other wasn't. And why was that? Because one did what was right. He did what God asked. God asks stuff of us. And if we love him, it's not a burden. His burden is easy. His yoke is light. Or, I'm dyslexic. It's the other way around. <laughs> but it's honest. But like some of us feel like going to church is drudgery. I mean, I'm like, when I was a kid, like I didn't want to get dragged to church. But now that I'm older and I've been through college and I've seen this, man, I love being here because it's a recharge boost that can be around people who have a common goal and mission. It's not just to kill time to have a social event before I can go back and do what I really want. And so in chapter two, I'm gonna go ahead and skip ahead. Like this is what God's response to this is. It says, uh, look, I'm gonna rebuke your descendants. I will spread animal waste all over your faces, the waste from your sacrifices, and you're gonna be taken away with it. Then you will know that I sent you this decree that I want the covenant with Levi to continue, says the Lord of hosts. Look, I don't know if you knew that this was in the Bible, but God literally said, I'm gonna shove poop in your face. <laughs> That's in here. It's crazy, that's what he says. This worship that you're bringing me, you bring me the leftovers? Like, and he even references it in the back. Like, if, a, if the governor of Texas were to show up at your house today, if you knew, if he gave you a two hour notice, would you go like the chicken that you might be eating after the service? Would you like gnaw off of it and be like, well, I'm kind of hungry and you kind of eat, do that. And like, there's a couple of the, like the soggy pieces at the bottom left and like half bitten off chicken breast. And you're like, I will, we'll break out the good plate for him and, and present it to him. No, God's saying you wouldn't do this for anyone of importance on your human realm. But what about me, your creator, your savior, the one who made you, knows you, knows you brought you out of slavery, and you're going to give me your leftovers? It's like, no, I want all of you or nothing. And he said, that's why it's so detestable to me. It's like, I'm going to, I'm just, I don't even want your offering. It says, like, I wish that someone would just close the doors and put out the fire on my altar. That's literally what God says. Can you imagine that? If we just shut the doors of the church and said, don't even show up. Like, if you're actually not going to be here, if you're not going to worship, if you're not going to come before me, just close the doors because we're wasting our time. That's what God is saying here. Because I can tell you a congregation that's going to change this community is one that's sold out. And that's why I'm excited. I'm bringing us this warning, not as I feel like we're doing a bad job, because as we grow, it's going to be so easy to forget. It's going to be so easy to rely on the production value. It's going to be so easy to rely on like, man, we got the seats filled. We got this place packed out. God's moving, and he is. But we cannot forget what makes all of this worth it? Look, look, look to the person like, to the, beside you, like right now. Like, please, just do it. Like, it's awkward, I know. Make eye contact, just like for a few seconds and like, look back at me. Like, look at them. Like, this is your family. 
I'm an only child. This means a lot to me. Like, I'm socially awkward because I didn't have any brothers or sisters growing up. <laughs> but like, y'all are my family, family now. Like, want me or not, like I'm here. <laughs> but I love that. And like, once we get bigger, it's gonna be so easy to, like, this is easy. I can come up here and I can talk to you and we can pat each other on the back and say, good job, high five, and go to lunch and forget and not care. But if we start doing life with one another, we start getting to know each other, you start finding out, like, how weird I am <laughs> and, like, how messed up each other are, man, that's when it's going to get difficult to love. But that's what the world needs to see, guys. That's what the world wants deep down is that acceptance that Jesus brings, that he gave each and every one of us. It's not good people and bad people. Gosh, there's sinful people. And then like Jesus came and forgave everyone if we would come in to accept it. Every one of us was dead. There wasn't more of a, you know, like, no, he was more dead than me. No, you were all dead. Like that's like, it's a leveling point. And when Christ entered our life, he came alive. And now we get to share that life with other people, the people sitting next to you, the guy at the grocery store that's sacking your, your lunch. You, get to, you have an opportunity to present something to him that changed us. And it's not gonna be through half-hearted sacrifice, I can tell you that much. Have you ever met a half-hearted salesman that doesn't even believe the product that he's selling? Like, I'm not going to buy it. Like, not even out of pity. Like, if he's kind of like, yeah, it kind of works. No, I like the dude, like the OxyClean guy. That's or like, oh no, it was the new guy, the flex tape. Like, I'm going to cut this boat in half and like, you know, slap it on there. Like, that makes me want to buy it. Like, he's got faith. He's going out there and he's like driving his boat put together with scotch tape. I don't know. But, it's, <laughs> but he sells it. But here's the thing is we have, so much, we have something so much better than a gimmick. We're not coming in here just to worship and to sing poetic words and stuff. My God is the God who brought the dead to life. My God is the one who can change Kanye West. Dead gum. If he can change Kanye, he can change y'all. God. And like, <laughs> it's like, this is why we sing. This is why we wake up in the morning. I was just, I was in the, the, uh, the not the traditional, like the even more traditional, like the, the 830 service, and I think I brought the, the average age down to like 65. Um, I was telling them, and you've probably heard me say this before, if your heart is beating right now, if you are awake, hopefully you're awake, please be awake, uh, you have a purpose. Every heartbeat is a rhythm of grace that you were given today. Our days are numbered. We're, we're here today, gone tomorrow. Gosh, we're not, we're not promised tomorrow. That's why Jesus says, don't worry about it. Worry about live 12 hours at a time. That doesn't mean we don't plan and stuff. No, but what he's trying to get us is in that frame of mind to see what's important and that's, not right, that's right now. It's the people around you. Jesus cares so much about your heart. He doesn't want your, I mean, yes, he wants us to worship in that, but he wants it to be for real. I mean, you can tell when you're in a conversation and the person's not engaged, that they're on their phone or just kind of like giving you nods or whatever. I mean, I had a professor once. He said he was at dinner with his wife and then midway through she goes, man, we're having a great conversation. I wish you were here for it. <laughs> Dang. <laughs> but that's true. Gosh, I, I, I don't even know where I am. The cool thing, if you keep on reading, uh, how am I doing on time? Yeah, all right. I can't read. I need glasses. But if you, if you keep reading on with Malachi, after he, he says the dung statement, um, he goes on to say, he, he, he brings him back to Levi. And he says, be like Levi. Because Levi had a clean heart before me. He knew what was up. He knew what to do. He was doing the right things. And he said, this is so cool to hear this. He says, my covenant with him was one of life and peace. I gave these to him and it called for reverence. 
And he revered me and he stood in awe of my name. True instruction was in his mouth and nothing wrong was found in his lips. He walked with me in peace and fairness and turned many away from sin. For the lips of a priest should guard knowledge and the people should seek instruction from his mouth because he is the messenger of God. But you, on the other hand, you've turned from the way and you have caused many to stumble. That hurts. He's saying like, man, their idol worship and this, this apathy that they've fallen into, they're causing other people to stumble. Because what we're called to do, and this is, what, this is so cool, is that God is calling them back to what they're supposed to be. They're supposed to be a light. It says that people come to him for instruction because he has truth. If you know Jesus, you have the truth in you. You have the knowledge that changes everything. He turns your messes into messages. You are a new creation. You're not just a sinner saved by grace. No, you are righteous and made holy because his holiness is now yours. And so like, man, it bugs me when people walk around like a whip dog. Like, I can't do anything right. No, you serve a God who, God, the old you is dead. You shed off that skin and now your identity is Christ. And so what he's saying here is like, that, man, we're supposed to be these beacons. And like, uh, this is not just like a, an Old Testament thing. This isn't just like, this is old angry God. Like if you go to Revelation 2, he talks about the Ephesian church. And this is crazy to me because they are rocking. They're doing everything right. It says, like they go on and says, I know your work, your labor, your endurance, that you can't tolerate evil, that you have tested those who call themselves apostles and who are not, and you have found them to be liars. You have possessed endurance. You have like tolerated many things. And because of my name, you haven't grown, near, grown weary. So he's talking about, this is a church. This is Ephesus. And he's listing all the great things, but listen to this. There's a but. There, pay attention to the buts in the Bible. It says, but I have this against you. You have abandoned the love of you had at first. Let me read that again. You have abandoned the love you had at first. Remember then how far you have fallen. Repent and do the works that you did at first. And so, again, I don't think we're at, we're not at this point. But we're talking about tipping points. We're talking about what God is doing and I don't want us to ever be at this point. I want us to always have the vision of Christ right in front of us to know why we're living, to know what our purpose is. Because like this, this church in Ephesians, or not in Ephesians, the Ephesus church, that they forgot the love they once had. It's like a marriage that's gone cold. There was the, mon the honeymoon stage like, you just can't get this person out of your, your head. You think about them all the time. You want to know everything about them, what they like, what they dislike, their favorite flowers. And then as the years go on, it's just, yeah, they're there. Man, that's sad. But it doesn't have to be that way. It doesn't. Gosh, God, in chapter three of Malachi, it's so cool. God like bets them because there's another part of the story that they're, they're not even tithing. They don't even care enough to like maintain the temple. And he says, you can't even give a 10th. And then this is what God says. He says, try me, try me, give a 10th and see what I do. See what I'm about to do. Won't I fill everything in abundance that I will open the floodgates of heaven and you will be fully filled. Try me. Put me to the test because I will be faithful every time. Gosh, it says in 2 Chronicles that the Lord uh, says when you depended on Yahweh, he handed everyone over to you for the eyes of Yahweh roam throughout the earth to show himself strong for those whose hearts are completely his. Guys, he's looking to use you. 
Jesus sought you before you ever even knew his name. He was chasing you down, trying to get you to see what true life is. And it says that God looked over the earth, searching for someone who had a right heart just to prove what he could do. And so I'm telling you tonight, or not tonight, this morning, gosh, if, if just 10 of y'all sell out, we could change this country. Because God can do more in a moment than any of us can do with our lifetime of efforts. And I wholeheartedly believe that. Because if we surrender our hearts to him and we continue to do this week in and week out, no matter the circumstances, no matter if we have a building or no building or a thousand people in here or 10, if we sell out, there is nothing that our God <laughs> cannot do. So I want to leave us with that. Leave us with the hope that's to come that Jesus is coming back one day. But in the meantime, love like nobody's business. Be the church. We don't just attend church. We are the church. And we get to love with no, no reservation because our life's not our own. Because we know that we were bought with a price. And so we don't have to fear death anymore. We don't have to fear these things. And, and I know, and I know, it's easy for me to say as a, as a single dude, because I know some of y'all have families that depend on you. You have, you have kids that are looking for a meal that you're trying to send to college, that you're trying to raise, right? And there's a lot on the line. And I get that. And it's a sacrifice. But let me tell you, it's worth it. Anything that you would lose in this life, what Paul says is garbage compared to the knowledge of knowing Jesus. And so, man, gosh, as we reach this tipping point, as we, as we look forward to what's to come, Man, I'm, I'm excited. I'm so excited because I've seen your kids. I'm your, I'm your youth director. And I've seen the fire that's in their gut. Gosh, they're ready. They want to see something real. And they're ready to go after it. And I even see the older generation. Like my parents are both 63. And they're coming around and say like, man, like I want to do this differently. I want to take this book serious. They're not just suggestions. Man, these are real life-changing things. And people are starting to see, guys, I feel like we are on the verge of revival. And like you can't schedule a revival. It's not something you just put on the bulletin. But man, when as people start doing the little things, when we start to spread like an epidemic and when our heart is right before the Lord, watch out. Like he's gonna move. All right, I'll pray us. God, thank you. God, for what you're doing, that's your word for crazy verses, like rubbing dung in our faces. God, I pray that it just, it wakes us up and just reminds us of who you are, that you are the God of creation. You're the God that saves. You're the God who loves. But gosh, God, I pray that we come to you with an earnest heart, that we're ready to serve, not out of just commitment or pull ourselves up by our bootstraps, but because you first loved us that we want to return the favor to everyone around us, and that we want to love you, that we don't want to do anything that would mess up that intimacy with you. Your laws aren't burdensome, but they give us life. God, thank you so much. Amen.